ever have spiritual questions about God, Jesus, or the Bible? Questions you've always wanted answers to. We've compiled a list of your questions via email, Facebook, or Help Me Understand cards. In this series, Help Me Understand, we look to help answer your frequently asked questions. Because who doesn't have questions? Well, everybody, good to see you today. We're super excited because we're starting a new season here at Colonial Church, and we're really going to take some time and focus on spiritual questions that people have. Here's what happened to me. Just the other day, I was thinking, I was reading in the Bible, and I saw, you know, Jesus asked a question. I'm like, why would Jesus ask a question? Like, doesn't he know a lot of stuff? And then I realized he asked a lot of questions. So I looked it up. Jesus Christ asked 135 different questions to people. So I wonder, like, why did Jesus ask people questions? Like, just looking for information? But if you look closely, you realize Jesus asked questions to people in order to help them along on their spiritual journey. In fact, if you take the word question and you look at the root word of the word question, it's the word quest. God draws us along on our spiritual journey through questions, questions that we have, questions that he might stir up in our hearts. And I think the hook that God uses to draw us on our journey is kind of shaped like a question mark. So following Christ has everything to do with following your questions. So in this series, help me understand, we have compiled your questions. Uh, we've been taking them over the last several weeks. And so today we are going to cover the three of your top five questions. These questions came from you. So these are your questions. We will cover three of the top five. I'm here with my good friend, Drew Day. Drew, you want to introduce yourself to everybody? Well, sure. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Drew Day, and I'm one of the elders here. And uh, I'm excited to go through this series with Jim. We've been talking a lot about uh, all of these questions, and there were several of these questions, and we're covering some very difficult questions this morning. Uh, but before we do, uh, let's throw out some ground rules uh, that kick off this entire series that we're gonna be going through over the next uh, four weeks. Uh, the, the first rule, uh, as we look at all these questions, number one, where the scriptures speak directly, there we stand. So for example, uh, when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me, we stand firm. Uh, rule number two, where the scriptures do not speak directly, there's room for differences, disputable matters. It is okay for us to have differing opinions on things that are disputable. For example, the Bible does not speak directly uh, about watching R-rated movies or about smoking cigarettes and things of that nature. Does the Bible speak directly about smoking cigarettes while watching R-rated movies? <laughs> I'm just trying to understand. No. Help me. No, I'm kidding. Uh, no, it does not. And then finally, our goal throughout the course of this entire series is that we want to be true to God. We want to be true to God's word, God's ways, and to be helpful. We don't want to go into some kind of theoretical dialogue on things that aren't helpful. Our, our goal and our heart throughout uh, the series of helping me understand is really to take the questions that are in our church family and address them together to be helpful uh, to everyone so that we can move forward and closer to God. And you know, the temptation to be overly philosophical, historical, or theological is really there because we just could easily go there. But we recognize if you were to go to the doctor and say, look, something's not right, I need some help, the last thing you need is a historical analysis of the thing that's wrong. You need help. And so what we're trying to do in answering these questions is to be helpful. That's the goal. And so we've compiled your questions. Today we're going to look at the three biggest ones. So three big questions. Question number one, here it is. Is it okay to have doubts? That was actually the number one overall question submitted by you. Is it okay to have doubts? So Drew, to the question, is it okay to have doubts, what, what would your answer be? I would say absolutely yes, it is okay to have doubts. And the, and the reason that I say that is that as you look through uh, the Bible. You look through the beginning of the Bible all the way through God's story. You see many people uh, that had issues with doubt. So all throughout the scripture, we see people that had great doubts. Um, Abraham doubted God's timing. Job doubted God's closeness. Uh, Moses doubted God's calling. Uh, Elijah uh, doubted God's protection. Uh, I mean, there's so many stories. In fact, I would almost say that almost every biblical story that we see, there's an aspect of doubt within the biblical story. Yeah, and think about the resurrection of Jesus when he gathers his apostles and he gives them the big great commission. It says in Matthew 28, 17, at the moment he gives the great commission, he, and he's there and he's resurrected. 28, 17, it says, and when they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. 
Like, really? Even at the great, yeah, doubt is a part of this journey. In fact, doubt raises questions, questions that we can follow all the way back to God. In fact, you can say every great character of faith in the Bible is a person who went through great doubt. Great characters, great faith is built through great doubt. We see this all throughout the Bible. In fact, uh, case in point, um, Jesus' 12 apostles, one of the 12 chosen apostles' name is Thomas, also known by many as Doubting Thomas. Thomas went on to become the apostle to India. He took the gospel of Jesus Christ into the entire region in the land of India and brought the gospel to these people. That took great faith. How in the world did he go from doubting Thomas to apostle to India? How did that happen? Well, we're going to look at that. Uh, when Jesus Christ rose from the grave, he appeared to his disciples in the upper room, but Thomas wasn't there. And so when they gave the report to the rest of the disciples, and Thomas included, they're like, hey, look, Jesus appeared. He's risen. Thomas is like, what? Really? No, no way. I'm from Missouri. Show me. <laughs> Unless I see the hands where the holes were in the side, and I'm not believing anything. So eight days later, in the same upper room, Jesus appears again. All the disciples are there, and Thomas and so here's what Jesus says to Thomas. This is in John chapter 20, verses 26 to 29. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my what? And my God, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. It's amazing watching Thomas in that text. He, he moves from his doubts to Jesus. He moves closer to God through following those doubts and going directly to the source. And so um, it is okay for us to take our doubts to Jesus. When we have doubts, because I think all of us do at times. In fact, in my own personal journey, the reason that I went to seminary, I was brought up in the church. Uh, I was taught to uh, believe certain things. And uh, there came a crossroads where I had to ask myself, do I believe this because it's indeed true? Or do I believe this because I've been taught to believe that it's true? And so I took those doubts and I went straight to seminary with those doubts to get closer to God through the process. And so, you know, how did doubting Thomas, how did uh, this doubting Thomas end up taking his doubts to Jesus and then ultimately taking the entire gospel in a missionary journey to all of India? Uh, he did that by following his questions uh, all the way back to Jesus. And the greatest part about it is that Christ said with, with uh, Jesus said with, with faith the size of a mustard seed, a small mustard seed, that he can do great things in us and through us. And so rather than uh, having your doubts, doubt your doubts, take them to Jesus, take them to God, because at that place, that's where uh, God can work in you and through you in powerful ways. I love that. Doubt your doubts. Instead of doubting your faith, doubt your doubts and then take those to Jesus. I love that. In fact, there's a theologian historically in the 11th century. His name was Anselm of Canterbury. He described all of this in a process, three Latin words called fetus, uh, fetus quarens intell intellectum, which is faith seeking understanding. Uh, what Anselm was saying is we, we take what we, what we, we go, look, I, I believe this. And then faith, believing, opens the door to greater and greater and greater understanding. We take that little mustard seed of faith that's really little, and we proceed through that with our questions to God, and it leads us into greater and greater understanding. That's what we see playing out. And I think there are a few facts we need to get on the table when we talk about doubt and faith and all this. Fact number one, every single person lives by faith. Everybody, doesn't matter who you are, even the scientist lives by faith. They live by faith in the scientific method. They live by faith in scientific principles or universal principles are unchanging. That's an unquestioned assumption, also known as faith. Every worldview hangs on something that is not being questioned and assumes some things. Everyone lives by faith. The humanist lives by faith in the human goodness or faith in human progress. Atheists live by faith in the fact that uh, the, their way of looking at things is all there really is, that God doesn't exist beyond their own current understanding. Everyone lives by faith. That's fact number one. Fact number two, um, not only does everyone live by faith, your faith is only as valuable as the object in which you place it. So strong faith in a weak chair is unwise. 
We all have faith, and the object of our faith is really the issue. And when we say Jesus Christ is the object of our faith, we're talking about the center of human history. God came to earth. His name is Jesus. His birth was on a Roman census, and his death was recorded in the Roman annals. He really came. He really died. He really rose. We can hang our hopes on him. Everyone's got faith. We're hanging ours on him. And it's faith-seeking understanding. And then the last fact would be that faith-seeking understanding is what this journey looks like. Little mustard seed, faith-seeking understanding. In fact, Scripture speaks about this, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. In, in Hebrews eleven six, it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Did you catch the journey language in this? Yeah, you yeah. have draw near, uh, who would draw near to God. Also journey language, uh, those who seek him. Listen, knowing God is a journey of seeking. It's faith seeking understanding. We take that little mustard seed of faith and we follow that. We take our doubts to Jesus. We don't run away with doubt. We bring them to him. We engage Jesus with doubt, just like Thomas. And our faith seeking understanding will turn us from a doubter into an apostle to some other place where God would send you. It's an amazing way that God moves like that. And the thing I love the most about this text here, it ends with a promise. It says, and that God rewards those who seek him. God rewards those on this journey of faith seeking understanding. There's a reward for those, and that reward is God himself. It's awesome. Yeah, there's some great news in, uh, in Hebrews 11, 6. And the, the, the great news uh, that we see is that you can have doubts and still trust in God. You can uh, doubt your understanding and still have trust in God. Uh, you can doubt uh, all sorts of things about your walk with God and still trust God throughout the process. And uh, there, there's a, a wise man once said that great faith is not the absence of doubt, but that great faith was built on the anvil of doubt. And so um, if you uh, are going through doubt. Obviously, many people within our church family are, uh, because this was the number one question. And uh, what we can do is if you go to our Colonial Church Facebook page, and you have to like it first, um, w later on today, we're actually going to post a 21-day study through the Gospel of John. Uh, it, John is 21 chapters, so every day we can sit there and, and walk through the Word and take our doubts directly to Jesus and we promise you, if you diligently seek him through that study, he will reward you. Yeah, it's awesome. It's a self-directed thing. It's really, really simple. It's not like, oh, i got to do all this stuff. John's got 21 chapters, one chapter a day. John 21, 31 says, these things are written, the Gospel of John, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and that by believing, you would have life in his name. So John was written so that we would know who Jesus is and can trust him for life and have life in him. And so the word believe occurs 98 times in the Gospel of John. So we're going to put that little 21-day uh, journey on our Facebook page. And all you got to do is read a chapter day. Every time in that chapter you see the word believe, circle it and say believe what? And then wrestle a little bit with the questions and you'll see. It's a great journey. We'll post that today. But that was the number one question. Is it okay to have doubts? The answer, yeah. Faith, seeking understanding is what that should look like. Second question, number two question overall was this one. Why does God allow pain and suffering? Um, I just want to acknowledge that this question is probably not coming from a philosophical place probably coming from a personal place. And so we just want to recognize that nothing we say in talking about pain and suffering is meant in any way to minimize or marginalize your pain and your suffering. Um, what we are going to do is address the question, why does God allow what he could prevent? Seems like he could prevent it, but he doesn't. Why does he allow it? There is a why. And so if you ask me the question, you know, why does God allow pain and suffering? The answer that I would give you is pain draws our attention to the best of God. It draws our attention to character qualities of God that you will not see or experience any other way. It's a sad truth, it's a hard truth, but it's a true truth. Now everybody help me out, nice and loud, true and false, true and false, true or false. Pain is hard to ignore. It's true, very hard to ignore. In fact, one rule in Kung Fu, the hands go where the pain is. Poke them in the eye where the hands go, right to the pain. You can't ignore pain. God uses our pain to draw our attention, not just to himself. God uses pain to draw our attention to special aspects of, I would say, the most beautiful aspects of God's character can only be seen and experienced through pain and suffering. 
C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Problem of Pain, and in the book he, he said this, quote, pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, but he shouts to us in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. I, I love that book by C.S. Lewis. If you haven't read it, we highly recommend it. Yeah. Um, I, I think one of the greatest uh, challenges in speaking about pain and suffering in a message setting like this is that we could really go on for a very long time and we just don't have the time to address it. But when you're going through pain and suffering, it's God's megaphone where he speaks directly into your life. It's almost like you have a blister and it's just pumping, 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 driving your attention to where that pain is. And so when we go through those seasons of life and go through those peaks and valleys, a lot of time uh, those valleys uh, of our lives are where uh, God grows us the most. And while we're in the midst of that pain and that suffering and that challenging time, it's almost like nothing else matters, but the pain's right before you and it's all you can see. Right there in that moment is when we get to experience the full characteristics of God. And by being in that spot, what it allows us to do is to experience God in new ways. And God takes us to greater depths in the midst of that pain. And so the only time that you can truly see and experience those attributes and those characteristics of God's full character is when you're in a place to need them. For example, the only time that we can truly understand that God is forgiving is when we need forgiveness. The only time that we can truly understand that God is comforting is when we need his comfort. The only time that we can truly understand that God is merciful is when we need mercy ourselves. And so these attributes of God, God uses in a powerful way to reveal the most beautiful aspect of who he is so that we can truly understand those attributes. Absolutely right. In other words, the best of God can only be seen and experienced in the worst of times. Uh, let me explain it to you this way. Um, uh, you've never seen the stars during the day. How many of you are stargazers? You like to look at the stars? I mean, we do. We'll lay out in our driveway and stare up at the stars. We love stars are beautiful. But in order to see the stars, what's required? The dark backdrop of space is required in order to see the beauty of the stars. In the same way, the dark backdrop of pain and suffering is required in order to see the most beautiful aspects of the character of God. God is forgiving. You'll only know it if you need forgiveness. He's merciful. You'll only know it if you need mercy. He's comforting. You'll only know it if you have loss and pain and grief. Uh, so uh, the worst of situations, painful and suffering situations, are opportunities to see the best of God that we could not normally see. Another example would be uh, God is a master pianist. He's a maestro. And the beautiful song that he is writing of our lives, this amazing song that he would write on God's keyboard, he uses both the white keys and the black keys, both the major chords and the minor chords. And in his hand, it's a very beautiful composition. God is a master artist, and he's painting this masterpiece called Your Life. And when God chooses his palette, he doesn't just choose bright, shiny, beautiful colors. He also uses dark strokes and dark tones in the masterpiece of your life to draw out the best of himself in the midst of your life. This is what we see happening all throughout the scriptures in every major character. In fact, we can see it really shine through in an amazing way in the life of a man named Joseph, whose story is found in Genesis 37 all the way through Genesis chapter 50. Yeah, Joseph is really the poster child for what it means to deal with pain and suffering. Uh, his life story is, uh, is one that just, wow, yeah. what, what a yeah. journey. Uh, he went through decades of pain and suffering, long suffering. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was, uh, his brothers were jealous of him because his father loved him more than the rest of his brothers. And so what they did is they, they took him out and they sold him into slavery. Um, he was sold into slavery. From there, he became uh, a, a servant in Potiphar's house. Uh, while he was there in Potiphar's house, Potiphar's wife falsely accused him, uh, and he was thrown into prison. While he was in prison, uh, he interpreted dreams uh, and, uh, of, of some of these other prisoners, and, and when they went out, uh, they had the opportunity to clear his name, 
and they left him there, and he was forgotten. And so all of this spans across several decades. And finally, at the very end of his story, in Genesis 50, 20, we see that Joseph now has the opportunity to speak directly to the brothers that put him into this long span of pain and suffering. And the most amazing thing about it, the brothers didn't even recognize that this was Joseph, the brother that they rejected, that they abandoned. And here's what he says in Genesis 50, 20. This is amazing. He says, as for you, to, your, to his brothers, you meant it evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Notice that the word meant is used twice. What his brothers meant for evil, God meant for good. And the most beautiful thing that we see through this very painful, difficult journey that Joseph walked through is that here is a hurting person. Can you imagine being abandoned, being rejected, being falsely accused, being in prison, being rejected, all of those things? I would think that it would make for a bitter person, but here Joseph had the opportunity to go through long suffering. The Greek word for it is actually long suffering. And so as he goes through this long suffering, he's able to forgive. And so a good God can use the areas of pain and suffering in our lives so that we can be forgiving, so that we can see how beautiful he is, so that we can see the goodness of God and those dark aspects of our lives. And, and, and finally, I'll close it out with this. Hudson Taylor, a great missionary, once said that at the, at the timber line of the strongest storms stand the strongest trees. So God can take difficult, painful areas in our lives and that suffering, and he can turn it into something good as we follow him to greater faith. Yeah, when, when you... When you picture human pain and suffering and then the beauty of God's character coming together and meeting at that place, the best picture is the cross. At the cross of Jesus Christ, we see man at his worst and we see God at his best. We see sin, we see forgiveness. We see rebellion. We see redemption. It is every time the scriptures point us to the love of God, they point us to the cross. Do you know that? Romans 5, 8. God demonstrated his own love toward us. How? In this. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John 4, 8 through 10. says, here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loves us and sent his son Jesus to be our atoning sacrifice for our sin. Every time the scriptures point us to the most beautiful character of God, the love of God, they point us to a place of pain and suffering called the cross. The cross is the place where pain and suffering meet. In fact, scripture goes on uh, to carry this conversation we're talking about a little bit further. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. I really want you to get these and, and allow these to, to just kind of cement what we're talking about right here. It all comes together. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 through 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of what? And the God of all what? Who comforts us in our affliction, pain, and suffering, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction, pain, and suffering, with the comfort with, with which we ourselves are comforted by God. It's a powerful uh, verse. You know, God wants us to recycle our pain. Just by a show of hands, how many have experienced the pain and suffering caused by the loss of a loved one? Now, how many have experienced the pain and suffering caused by financial hardship? How many have felt the pain and suffering caused by addiction? How many of you know someone going through addiction? How many know the pain and suffering caused by depression? You know, it's interesting in this text that the prerequisite to experience God's mercy is to walk through the season of pain. To walk through the season of pain and suffering, it's required because 
God is the God of comfort who comforts us in our affliction. In those challenging times, those challenging times can become the best times. And then we can use that. Many people raised their hand just a moment ago. And you know somebody that's going through the very pain and suffering that you've walked through. And so what would it look like if we would be a people and a, and a, a church family that help people walking through the very pain and suffering that we've been able to walk through in our own lives? That's mm -hmm. exactly what the text that's is saying. That's it. That's it. Why did God allow this? Well, the other guy right there is going through it, doesn't really know God's comfort. You do on that issue. Hey, maybe part of why you went through it is to pass it on to them. I believe, amen. I believe that, that healing is complete in our lives when we do come full circle. When we have gone through that, whatever it is, pain and affliction, and we've been comforted by God in all of that, and then we see somebody going through that same thing, and when we extend and reach out to help them with the thing that God had given us, now we have kind of full circle. I feel like that's where healing really becomes complete in that moment. And so here we see in this text, God is the father of mercies. You will never know him as the father of mercies until you need mercy. God is the God of all comfort. You will never know him as the God of comfort. Those are two aspects of God, mercy and comfort. You'll never know apart from needing mercy and comfort. Why does God allow it? Because he wants, the, he takes the worst of times to give you the experience of the best of him. And it does, listen, it doesn't make it go away. It transforms it all. It brings our wounds and our pain into the healing reality of God himself. And we become wounded healers to other people. And I think that recycle emblem is really a great way to look at 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. God wants us to recycle the pain and suffering we've been through. In fact, this is the story of Scripture. Jesus was the suffering servant. God's people have always been known as the suffering people of God. Always, always. Uh, Philippians 1, 29 says, It's not only given to you to believe on Christ, but to suffer for his sake. This is part of the story, my friends. And until we bring it to the cross and learn to live this out, it will not make sense. And I'm just trying to, we're just trying to say it's the worst of times that draw us to the best of God to see and to experience. If you want to go a little further with this, because it really, honestly, our, we're, our struggle, we struggle with this conversation because we know we're talking in a big picture and we know each of you have a very specific pain and suffering that requires specific wisdom that we can't even talk about because there's so many and we're just over here with a bigger picture and we just want to recognize that that's not really fair. And so we want to help you get some tools to carry forward with your own specific questions and challenges. So, for example, C.S. Lewis's book, The Problem of Pain, get it, read it. It's a smaller book. It's amazing. In Lewis's typical fashion, he really gets to the heart of it. And then I also would recommend a book to you uh, from one of my all-time favorite theologians, N.T. Wright, wrote a book called Evil and the Justice of God. It's a smaller book, and it is phenomenal. It gives you the big why. Why would God have a creation that involves this? And, and you'll find that N.T. Wright's answers are deeply, deeply satisfying. Deeply satisfying. So we got some questions. The first big one was, uh, you know, is it okay to have doubts? Our answer, well, yeah. The way to handle them is faith, seeking understanding, mustard seed faith. The second question was, why does God allow pain and suffering? The answer is, you know, pain draws our attention to the best of God that we wouldn't see or experience otherwise. And then the third question, is divorce really a sin. Now, again, we want to acknowledge that more than likely behind this question is the previous question, pain and suffering. And so we don't want to minimize anybody's pain or experience with divorce, but we also want to acknowledge to you guys, there's no possible way that we can cover every aspect of the topic of divorce and remarriage right here, right now. You know, what about divorce and grounds and remarriage and grounds? We, we're, 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 here's what we can do. We can answer this question so everything you are about to hear is to answer this question. Is divorce really a sin? And nothing we're about to say contradicts the other kinds of passages about grounds. Nothing. So you just need to understand, we are going to answer the question, is divorce really a sin? So, so to you, Drew, I ask the question, is divorce really a sin? What would you say? Yeah, this is a very difficult one to answer. But the truth of the matter is that uh, divorce always involves sin, whether it's your own sin whether it's your spouse's sin or whether it's both of your sin. Um, just by a show of hands, how many people have experienced the pain of divorce? A lot of hands going up. 
How many uh, know someone going through a divorce right now? Yeah. A lot of hands going up. Yeah. A very, very sensitive and difficult topic. Um, sadly, I think in, in many churches, we've taken people that have gone through a divorce and we've put them over into this category that's like they've committed the unpardonable sin and they're in a second class and nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing can be further from what is in scripture uh, than that. And so on behalf of the church, we, we both want to apologize that it's been that way. Uh, it doesn't, it shouldn't be that way. It was never meant to be that way. And so we just want to apologize if the church has ever done that to you or someone that you've known mm -hmm. that's been through divorce and been a product of divorce. We're both products of divorce. Our parents were both divorced at an early age. So we know the pain and the suffering caused from it and the consequences that are caused from divorce. So we just want to say that. Uh, on behalf of the church, we do apologize that we've treated this like a, like a sin that's, you know, um, put in a different category against other sins. Right, and that is exactly what has happened in religious circles. Divorce has become a sin treated unlike any other sin. It becomes a letter that you wear for the rest of your life. It becomes a status. And what we're, we're saying, we're calling the brown card on that going, no. The Bible nowhere lifts divorce and says, uh-oh, this is a special one. It's not like the other ones. It's forever you're branded. We're going to say no because the scriptures are very clear. Now, I don't know why. I don't know why because I didn't grow up in a church home. I don't know why religious people do what they do with this. Um, I think it's a misguided effort to protect and guard God's vision for marriage. I think that's what is behind it. But the reality is religious people will approach divorce in a way that treats it unlike the Bible does. And so um, one day, Jesus had the religious leaders of the day come to him with the very question about divorce and how it all plays out. They came to him and asked him the question. And so Jesus took the, the opportunity to paint a bigger picture about marriage and then divorce in light of marriage. So let's look at that. Mark chapter 5, or 10 rather, and verses 5 through 9. So Mark 10 five through nine, it says, and Jesus said to them, the them is the religious leaders of the day, because of your hardness of heart, he, you talk about Moses and the law, wrote you this commandment. The commandment's Deuteronomy 24, one that you can divorce, that it's allowable. Then Jesus goes on, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man what? There you go. Yeah, this is a powerful text, and I, I see three truths just jump right off the page. And uh, the, the first one is that Jesus affirmed God's original uh, intention for marriage. And, and basically, God's math for marriage is one man, one woman, one lifetime. That's it. Uh, number two... Uh, Jesus insisted on our obedience to it. The very end of that passage, he says, what God has joined together, let man not separate. We hear that in wedding vows all the time. And then finally, uh, the last thing I see is that anything less than God's intention is sin. So when we look at the topic of divorce, the root is always sin, whether it's your spouse's, whether it's yours, or whether it's both of your sin. Yeah, I think the... The interesting thing that Drew mentioned is like anything less than God's intention is sin. That, my friends, by definition, is the, is the Greek word for sin. Or martia is to miss the mark. When God has an intention for something, whether it's marriage or whatever, anything short of God's intention is sin. So if you are party to a divorce and that marriage ended, it just fell short of God's intention. It wasn't one man, one woman, one life. It didn't happen. You fell short. Then you have a part in that sin. And so what we would say is, Here's the question then. How are we supposed to treat sin then? The answer is we treat it biblically. And the Bible tells us what to do with sin. 1 John chapter 1 is an amazing passage. In there we see uh, really what fellowship and, and uh, what sinners connecting and fellowshipping with a holy God looks like. 1 John 1 says like God is light. In him is no darkness at all. So he's holy. But we have darkness. So John's like, okay, take your sin into the light, confess it, bring it to God, give it to God. His son, Jesus Christ, on the cross covers your sin, and then you have fellowship with God. In other words, in this text, uh, 1 John uh, chapter 1, there's a specific verse that I want to highlight. It's verse 9. This is kind of the summary. Here it is. 1 John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our sins... 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from what? Uh, how much? Oh, I'm sorry. All except for the unrighteousness of divorce. You didn't read that in there? If we confess our sins, he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First John chapter 1 is all about humans getting right with God. God's a holy God, and we're not a holy people. And he sent his son Jesus to a cross to take our sins off of us, to remove that barrier so that we can be holy in Jesus. And so we bring our sins, we confess. The word confess in Greek is the word homologeo. It means to say the same thing, to say what God says about it. You know, God... I was a part of a divorce. We fell short of your intention. I played a part in it. I'm sorry. Forgive me. And so we take our sins to Christ. We confess them. And biblically speaking, we turn away from them. And we go and go God's way after that. So, uh, so for example, um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the Apostle Paul gives a very long conversation going on about divorce, remarriage, and all the scenarios that can play out. And in that very chapter, Paul's like, look, Here's a rule I give all my churches, which sounds kind of like a universal principle we should all think about. 1 Corinthians 7, 17, Paul said, here's my rule. Wherever you are when God called you, and he's talking about divorce and remarriage, wherever you are, live that calling. In other words, the moment you get what God's intention is, get right with God there, live on the other side of that line. In other words, divorce is not the unpardonable sin. Divorce doesn't put you in a second-class category where now you've got to ride in the back of the bus for the rest of your Christian life, or you've got to wear a shirt with a scarlet letter on it. It's not what the Bible teaches at all. We confess, we give it to God, and then we turn right around. Now, let me just say this, because I'm a pastor, and so I've done a lot of weddings, and I've only had that I know of right now one of all, probably about 100 weddings I think I've done, one divorce so far. And let me just say, when a person goes into it and they like get married and they get divorced later, what I see is a person who's really not interested in doing marriage God's way. So to say that any of us might be guilty, a guilty party in the sin of divorce, if you're going to confess that sin, you want to be made right with God, let me give you the, the part that has to be included. And that is to confess and to be made right with God is like any other thing. We say, God, now I want to go your way from here on out. So if you're going to go ahead and get married, you know, get divorced, whatever, and then go, oh, I'm going to confess it to God. Now I'm going to go and have another marriage and it's kind of do it my own way again. No, we go God's way. The only way to do a marriage is one man, one woman, one lifetime. There we stand. We're living in a day where the one man, one woman's the issue, but I'm just going to say, yeah, that's a problem, but let's go one man, one woman, and one lifetime, because that's an issue too, my friends. He and I, we're in, we are married, not together, but we're married. <laughs> Our intention is lifetime. There is no D word, unless D means beat each other to death or something like that. No D word. We don't have it. It's one lifetime. So it was A.W. Tozer in his book, The Root of the Righteous. He said it this way, and I think he pulls it all together. Quote, the idea that God will pardon a rebel who has not given up his rebellion is contrary both to Scripture and to common sense. In other words, if you've done it wrong in marriage, confess it, get it right, move on. We will, but don't go do it that way again because that's not good. Our goal is the goal we stated at the beginning. What was our goal that we stated at the outset? Our goal is to be true to God. God's word, God's ways, and to be helpful. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for the opportunity to, uh, to speak about these difficult topics. Uh, God, thank you so much that um, you give us the freedom to gather together on the weekends and throughout the day, throughout the week, uh, to talk about you. Thank you so much for giving us a family that's on a mission. Uh, God, where you raise us up, uh, bring us in, raise us up, send us out, Lord. Uh, I just want to pray for everyone here, Lord, somebody. Uh, we know that a lot of people are going through doubt. A lot of people are going through pain and suffering in very difficult times right now. And some people are in the middle of a divorce or going through a divorce. And, God, we just hope that we've been helpful today. And so, uh, God, I just pray over the church, Lord. I pray that uh, you continue to guide us and direct us into all truth. Yes. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Amen.